And open your word today, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And once you get there, would you give the praise band a hand clap of praise? I'm so glad for the efforts that they put in. You know, sometimes uh, two and three times in a week they come here and they, uh, they, fill the, they fill the air with worship. And sometimes I sleep through it because I'm not here. Uh, Praise the Lord. Well, man's got to get his rest. Amen. <laughs> uh, I want to talk to you, though, about the idea that crossed my mind here a few weeks ago. And even if you look at the, the Lord has been so good to me, I feel like what? Traveling on. Traveling on. Now, what does that look like? The Lord has been so good to me. I want to sit right here with you. No. I feel like traveling on. It sounds to me like you're going to walk that good walk, right? The walk of faith, right? You know, and, uh, and I guess running is kind of important because we are told, we are encouraged in the scripture to run the race. <clears throat> Amen. The good race. That's kind of traveling on. It's not sitting sedentary in one place. No. Because once, once you come to a place in your life and you realize in your faith walk, that you're not walking, you might want to say, Lord, why? Uh, I'll go back to that story in the book of Acts. And you can find it, I'm pretty sure, in Acts chapter 3 where that, that lame man, is, he's at the, he goes to church every time the doors are open. He's there and he's looking for alms. He's looking for something. And this, this would be a good message. So if I write this down, I'm not going to preach this. Uh, but he's there and he's asking for something. He's looking to get something. And, and quite honestly, when you come to church, you should come looking for something. That's fine. Because this is where we're going to be able to get together with the saints of God and pray to have our needs met. And it's interesting when we come and we start walking that walk of faith. It's, I, almost said, I said the other day to somebody, it's kind of auto magic. But it's not magic. It's God honoring your faithfulness. You see, he's made lots of promises to us. He wants to bless us in so many ways. But have we been faithful with the gift he's already given us? We, he's given us a gift of life. Amen. I, I look in the Old Testament and I see, you know, he, he, uh, he, he made Adam and he made him from the mud. And apparently, uh, we got, most, most boys like to play in the mud. All the mothers said, Amen. <laughs> He'll get there. Uh, but then it, it wasn't good that he would be alone, so God, God cared for him. And now, see, you know what? I need you to, to have fellowship with me, but it's not fair that you don't have someone that you can identify with. And so he didn't reach into the mud, and the ladies say, thank God. <laughs> they reached into his side and yanked out a rib. Well, I, I don't know if he yanked it out. That was, that was me. Uh, it just seems painful to me. But, <laughs> but anyway, so he forms her from... The man. And it would be symbolic because this would be one come alongside. And did you know that there's many in, in the church today, male and female, that will come alongside to help you? And that's what this is supposed to be for. You, you may not know this. When my wife and I, years ago, when we had come uh, into the church, I mean, really came into the church, not just into faith, because we both were believers before before we really got, at least, now my wife was raised, she was going to church as a child, I didn't, but as an adult, I started going, and then I, you know, I get married, and then we still didn't go, but then we started going regularly, and the reason we did is because we had something, that, there was something we needed, and I wasn't buying all the stuff, even back in the 1970s, I wasn't buying all the rhetoric about how to raise your children, Hello? One of the things I learned in the church is there's many people in the church that don't know how to raise their kids either. Amen. But there were many who did. And they were not afraid to correct if they needed to. And if they were, if I asked, I got I got encouragement, I got direction. The Bible says that we should seek wisdom. You know, seek the and sometimes we, we, we miss this point though. In the multitude of counsel, there is wisdom, or you could say safety. But I wanted to do that which is wise. <laughs> How many of you want to live the rest of your life and have it invested wisely? You live the rest of your life because you, uh, 
you really, you should expect a return on your investment. Here's the thing. God invested in us on the cross at Calvary. And when you come to him, you get this earnest, the down payment. You have faith, you believe, the Holy Spirit comes, you have this earnest of the Spirit. And some of us, we seem to be satisfied with just the down payment. But as we live our life, we find out that there's still things. There's, there, there, there is, it's like, wait a second, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm my own man. No, you're not. You were bought with a price. Mm -hmm. Okay, well then, okay, Jesus should be taking care of me, and he does. But there's something to be said for me. How many of you want to be a good, a good tenant? Mm -hmm. Since this is a temporary place in which we live. You know, that, there's that song called Temporary Home. And some of you might remember that. Because this is our temporary home. But whether you rent or whether you own, you should make the best of it. You should take care of it. You should be a good tenant. And I'm talking about your physical bodies as well. What you eat, what you drink, how you treat it, and how you use it to treat others, how you do things. And I'm not going to get into details about it, but I'm just telling you, that is, that is the first home that we have to take care of. Because every believer ought to have three homes. Now, I have never had the, I, the, the thought that I wanted to be a landlord or anything like that. Uh, because I know what it takes to maintain a, a building and... Uh, it's, it's tough enough to maintain my own. <laughs> um, some, and sometimes you, you, you're, you're renting a place or whatever, and something needs to be taken care of, and you're a good tenant, so you call the landlord and say, hey, listen, uh, uh, you know, I've got a leaky faucet. And, and, the, and the landlord says, I, I'll try to get to it, and a couple weeks pass by, and you might call him back up, and you can be like Denny and just you know, berate him and you know, threaten to withhold your rent. You could do that. By your right, you could do it. Or you could say, you know, um, you know, I, I might be able to do this. Can we work something out? We've only read it a few times in our lives, but uh, that was the kind of tenant that I was. But here's the thing. I made sure that the landlord knew that I could do what I said I could do. If I had to fix the plumbing, if I had to fix the electrical work, I wasn't just, I don't know. Wait a second. How many of you have to pay for your water? And you know, a leaky faucet can add, anyway, I am not going to go into details, but you understand what I'm saying? You still need to take care of it. And, and here's the thing. Now, I've had, I, there was one place that we lived, and uh, the window got broke, and the landlord took care of it. But I was the one that broke it. It, wasn't, it was an accident, but he fixed it. Didn't get charged for it or anything like that. But there, I know there are other landlords, you break that window, you're going to pay for that. Well, they'll, they'll be tacked on to your next month's rent. Amen? And wait, how many think that that's just? It's right. It's, 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 hey, you should expect these sort of things. How much more should you be taking care of this, your earthen vessel? Now, I appreciate the fact that most of y'all come in here, you know, get, get your hair combed back real nice, and, you know, uh, I, I assume you probably got your, your, you got some, you either clean clothes or your cleanest dirty clothes on. But, <laughs> when, there was a time in my life when I went to church, somebody came to take me to church, and he got the laundry basket, and he got my cleanest dirty clothes, and can you imagine how he had to find out which ones were cleaner? <laughs> All I can tell you is a man had a, a stomach of, 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 of cast iron, but because, uh, yeah, the clothes have been laying there for a while. But my point is, take care of the home in which you're in right now. But there are three homes as we, and, and that we as believers should look to possess, and we should look to either we're maintaining the one that we've got, or we're, we, want, we want to be ready for the one that we're going to move into. Amen? Every one of us should be looking to have three homes. Now, I know there's some people here in this town, in New Buffalo, there's a lot of second home people. Uh, there are some people, you know, there are celebrities that have lots of homes. And I, of course, you know, they've got the money. I'm sure uh, they probably don't do all their own maintenance. I do know there were a few here, though, that did. They were ordinary people, movie stars, but they, they did their own work, and or, but they could afford to have it done. I mean, um, I mean, I mean, some celebrities own a collection of real estate. Oprah Winfrey used to have a home here in, in the area in New Buffalo. And, uh, they got got bought by some country singers, husband and wife team. Uh, you know, actually, and, and then Oprah Winfrey has uh, last. I, I was reading about it. She's got a, a forty-something acre uh, ranch or a home. They call it a home, but I think it's a ranch. In California, uh, she's got a house in New Jersey, and I understand she still maintains a, 
a, they call it an apartment, but I can't remember how many thousand square feet that apartment is, but that is not an apartment. Okay? That's crazy. But my point is, they've got all of these again. Every, but every, every one of us who believe should have at least three homes. And let me explain. The three homes you should have is you should have your heavenly home, you should have a Christian home, and you should have a church home. Now, I'm, I'm giving you this because you need to be speaking to people that you say they believe on Jesus. But they don't believe in the homes. Come on. They believe on Jesus, but they don't believe on... See, here's the thing. That first one, our heavenly home, that heavenly home has to do with our salvation and, and our, our eternal destiny. That second has to do with our home and our family. And, 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 and last, the local body of Christ, of, of which we become members of, is our church home. I mean, a person could have a heavenly home without having a Christian home or a church home. But what a shame that is when they don't have all three. Now, I believe that what, what, what we find in God's Word, it has a lot to say about each one of these homes. And I also believe that it's pretty clear that His desire is that we have all three. I don't know, I, I can't speak for you. You have to speak for yourself. But I want all that God has for me. Did you hear that? I want to get everything he's got. Now, after I've said that, there are days, I wish I hadn't said it. <laughs> because of recognition comes responsibilities. And it's interesting how it is when we find out who we are in Christ, where we stand, and we realize what we are required to do. Because that is what God wants of us. That's, our, that's the, the, the will of God for us. And he's saying, okay. I need a break here. This is too much for me. How sad it is when you don't have a Christian home, you don't have a church home, because you're going to have to carry that load by yourself. We all need to have the fellowship of saints. I mean, having the first home ought to lead us. <laughs> having that first home, what is that first home? Our heavenly home. If you truly have that heavenly home, it should lead you to want to have those other two. A Christian home and a church home. Knowing that our eternity is secure. Knowing that we are saved. And knowing that, that uh, it, it should affect our present and it also affect the rest of your earthly existence. Is this making sense to you this morning? Yeah. Well, let's let me make sure that you, I don't miss any details this morning. Every person ought to have a heavenly home. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can read with me if you like. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If, here it is, if indeed... <laughs> if indeed having been clothed we shall not be found naked for we who are in this tent grown being burdened not because we want to be unclothed but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life now he who has prepared us for this uh, very thing is God who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the Lord, uh, from the body, and to be present with the Lord. Therefore we make it our aim, say it's my aim, Amen. whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him, for we must appear before Him in the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I all trust, also trust are well known in your consciences. 
having that first home should give you a desire to want the others. You came to an altar one day because there was a bell that rang or there was some, some sense of urgency or there was some sense of your mortality or and, and, and maybe you, you realize one day I am a wretched person, I'm a wretched man and, and you realize that the only way to get away from that because you've tried maybe, maybe uh, most all of your life that you've been alive, you've tried to change, you've tried to be a better person but it just didn't come to pass. You just couldn't pull it off. Because that old nature stayed. That old, the old man was still alive and, and the old man and nature still ruled and, and, and it controlled you. Now I know that we uh, that salvation has to do a lot with our free will. We get to choose him. But realize this, we choose him. But you got to understand he chose you first. Yeah. And you get this. We love him because he all right, God, you started this. And did you know that he who began a work will do what? But we have to get in a position in our life, and I walk with him, that he can do that. You can't remain being the same old sorrowpuss that you've been. I'm being nice, aren't I? You can't stay that way. You've got to really seek him. And not only that, but you find that, okay, so you've got the word of God, you start doing your, novice, your, your devotions, you're going to church, you're going to Sunday school, you're doing all of this. But when I, well, here's something that could be missing. You might need more of the fellowship of saints. I'm sorry and I apologize for most churches. We've not been very good at being the fellowship of saints. We want to come to we want to come and gather together and have our name on the on the attendance maybe and maybe sit in our favorite place on the pew, but you know what? What are you guys doing? That's up to you. I'm going to stay over here. You stay in your pew. I'll stay in my pew. And I'll, wait a second. Here's the thing. Go back to the three things you need to know. Number one, who you are. Number two, where you stand or today where you're sitting, uh, and what you do. You think about how it is that we're supposed to be fitly joining together. You look at someone and you feel that you've got something and you, you, you declare in your own judgment they don't have that. So you hang on to it. But did you know that the love of, that God gave you was not meant for you to hang on to? It was made for you to give away. That faith that God gave you to believe, did you know that God gave that to you? Now you can't give away your faith, but you can share it. In other words, if I come down here with these young men and I go down and I share my faith, that doesn't mean that I'm with, I, I lose it. No. I, can I tell you that if, if, they, if they share faith, if I share my faith with them, what happens is that they, they grow in grace and they grow in the knowledge of Jesus. And did you know when they grow, I grow? Amen. And here's something that maybe you've never thought of. I, I do on a regular basis. If I don't grow in faith, you won't. Wow, that's a big responsibility. Well, pastor, it doesn't all... No, it does. Because you've got to know who you are, where you stand, what to do. If the man or woman of God who's leading you in your Sunday school or preaching from the pulpit or leading, or, or leading in worship, if they're not growing, they can't help you to grow either. So we need to grow. Individually and as a group. Somebody say amen. amen. But we gotta get our, we got to get our priorities right. The first thing is, salvation is imperative. Amen? It says this, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made of hands, eternal in heaven. You don't have that promise until you are born again. Amen? Amen. You don't have the promise. Salvation is the prerequisite. Salvation is the imperative. Salvation, if, if, if one is to ever hope of a, to enjoy a home in heaven, they must be saved. They must be born again. Now let me help you out because many times we get this idea, well, I'm saved, so I'm done. I'm just going to sit back and wait. No, you now have to walk being born again. You, you have to walk receiving that new heart. You have to walk and you need to study to show yourself approved. You've got a brand new heart and you're, a, and, and there, many, every one of us, we were at one time in our walk with the Lord, we were baby Christians. 
And wait, and some of us we had to have people lead us around. And, and, and wait, maybe you've never done that. Maybe, maybe every one of you, you know, you became that perfect Christian right out of the gate. But I gotta tell you, when I when in my early walk with Christ, and every once in a while I still stumble around. But I gotta tell you, there was a time in my life, in my early days walking with the Lord, that I fell. That I fell down in the old pit that I was in before. Why? Because I wasn't wise enough to stay away from it. I'll go back to my testimony. That man that came to my, my mobile home and, and he broke in and he found my cleanest, dirty clothes and he put my clothes on me and took me to church because he knew I was in a pit. I was in deep despair. Now he knew that I knew Jesus. He knew that I had been born again because he was there. When he, when he was there during that day when, when I, I stood and I testified. But he was also there and he watched as I fell. And he felt bad because he felt that he should have been there helping me Stand up. But did you know that you're not going to have somebody there all the time? And once in a while, somebody's going to see you. They're going to know where you are. And if you're held in your guilt and shame, if you're still chained down by your stumbling around, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not, I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. you got to be born again. And you've got to realize that we are not a finished work until the work is finished. We've got to live our lives. I mean, the idea, uh, let me... The idea that we're everybody in the world, that we're all going to go to a better place. And we love to hear that at a funeral. Well, you know they're going to a better place, but you know that person. You say, I don't know about that. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Let's be honest up in here. The truth of the matter is we don't all go to a better place. It's simply not true. The place that we're going to spend eternity will be determined by one thing and one thing. Thing alone. Have we believed the gospel? To, to believe, to believe means to embrace it by faith. To believe the gospel, we got to believe Jesus, first off, he lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, he died, and why did he die? He died as a sacrifice for our sins that we might be saved. Uh, some of us who want to preach that gospel that because Jesus died, everybody's saved. No. That's his desire. That's what he wants. It is not God's will that anybody should suffer, but that everybody should come to the knowledge of his son's, his, his son's sacrifice and believe upon him and be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul said this, of whom I am chief. I'm the worst, I'm, 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 well, maybe he's saying I'm the best sinner. I'm the worst sinner. I'm, I'm really good at it. You know, I can tell you, I, I know some people that today you look at them and you could never believe the things that they did or that they're capable of because you've never seen them. I still have memories of the old me, you know, the BC, the before Christ me. I was a pretty good guy. I didn't change that much. Oh, <laughs> And wisdom had to speak and have her way. Her name is Debbie. Uh, yes, here's the thing. Salvation is not just because you have the idea of it, just that you only believe. That's not it. Salvation is not of you. It's not of me. It's not of a denomination. It's not of a particular religion. But I will tell you this, that salvation is of God. I mean, did you catch what Paul said here? He says, Christ Jesus came to do what? To save. And that is the same thing that Jesus said during his earthly ministry. Uh, in, in Luke chapter 19, he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he came for. Wait a minute. Know who you are. Know where you stand. Know what to do. He came. Did you know that Jesus? I, I, I'm gonna, let's get real with this. Until his baptism, did Jesus really know who he was? 
I mean, we don't want to get into a deep discussion about it, but think about it. But the, after his baptism, what happened? Heaven opened up. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and there was, there was a voice from heaven. This is my son. Now, wait a second. At that moment, if there was ever, if, the, if there was ever any doubt in the mind of a man, Jesus, that doubt just got removed. Because his father spoke to him. This is my son. So when Jesus cried out when he was on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. Do you think he knew what he was talking about? He knew what needed to happen. He knew what needed to be done. And he was finished on the cross. It was, but, but the, get this. He said it was finished. He didn't say like, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. No, that's not what he was doing. That was his victory cry. It's finished. I finished my race. Come on now. He, he gave it all on the cross. But if you notice, that was his, his, his work as a man was finished, or was it? The gift of salvation was now man, made manifest. But there, were going to, there was going to be additional proof that, we, that God was going to provide. Remember, salvation is of God, and God's going to provide the proof. How did he provide that proof? Well, uh, Jesus did not stay in that grave very long, did he? He had fulfilled the task given to him by his heavenly father. It is finished. And there is nothing more that needs to be done. There is nothing more that can be done to, for your salvation. There's nothing else. Except the gift. Except the promise. And embrace it in faith. And respond. Hmm. So it's of God, and salvation is also something else. Did you know salvation is eternal? In, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them. What, what, now they Here it comes. You might want to circle this, underline, I don't like, lines, underline twice, highlight it, and circle. Because what he says here, he, and then he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. You know, if you believe in him, but you don't obey him, you really don't. You don't really don't believe. All it, it, read, read, read at the beginning of the book of Romans. Although they knew God, they didn't recognize him as God. God forbid that we would remain in our sin. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, salvation is eternal by definition. That means that our that, that true salvation, when we're walking in it by faith, it will never end. Unfortunately, many have believed men rather than believing God. Men will tell you that your salvation is temporal, it's fleeting. No, listen, when you come into faith, when you come into salvation, it's for eternity. But you can't stop just there, just with a, I'll just say a statement of faith, saying that I believe, but then not acting upon it. Men will tell you that your salvation is fleeting, and like, your, like our youth or our health, it can fade away, but it does not. God said this in John 10, 28. I have given unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Nobody can pull you from his hands. Nothing says you can't walk away from his promise. So here we have it. Every person ought to have what? A heavenly home. And then there comes that second home. Now, we need to have a Christian home. Just to be clear, when you start thinking about a Christian home, I, I went through this. I don't know anybody who hasn't. We had little children. I'm, I'm not even sure how to, how, to, you know, how to raise children. And you know, and I wasn't raised in the church. And I didn't have any good examples as a child that I'm aware of. And I look back and I, you know, I've actually talked to some of my aunts and uncles. They say, why didn't you ever take me to church? I mean, wouldn't that be what they should have done? They took their kids to church. They went to church. Why didn't you take me? Never asked. But well, we, I've grown from there. I understand today even more why that happens. 
There are people in your life right now that you've probably never even invited to church. We won't get too deep into it, but there, there are various reasons. Some of us, we have a problem with, uh, you know, we're not very, we're not much for social things. I actually had it when I came here. There was someone who, who actually stated it. And I, you know, sometimes I think, well, I guess they're getting their wish because uh, I asked him one day, I said, why, you know, why aren't you telling this person or that person? And the, the, you know why I actually got the answer was? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that, you know, we'll get so many people in here, you'll forget about me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> now, just to be clear, I'll never forget this person, okay? <laughs> And it's the same kind of people that said, well, we, 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 were, we got into ministry, and even when we came here, well, we think you love the kids more than you do us. Go figure. It's not true. But did you know that you need to be, listen, you need to raise children in the way that they should go? And if you want to learn what it means to be Christian, start raising some children. Amen. If nothing, that's a trial of your faith. Okay? <laughs> Moving right along, though. A Christian home is not a perfect home. I don't know there's, there's any such thing. Wait, she's not in here. Um, my wife is a sinner. I know that might shock a few of you. Wait. I could be a sinner. My daughters were sinners. Those of you who know them might find it easy to believe because some of you think you know some things and there were some things that go, wait a second, what about you? Were you a sinner? Not really. My wife is a sinner, her husband is a sinner, their father is a sinner. Oh wait, that's me. How could I say those things? I mean, I can see it in the tabloids now. <laughs> Seriously, wait, wait. Who are we trying to fool? See, real. Who are we trying to fool? You and, and you, you, you're not going to have a perfect home, a perfect Christian home. There's always going to be something, and, 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 and there are some things in your life that maybe didn't bother you before, but suddenly things start to bother you. Maybe it's the movies that you watch. Maybe some of the things that you read. Or some of the things you bring home from work and start sharing, you know, it's tough if you work in a steel mill or you're a truck driver. Or actually, it's just tough if you're just a man. It, it, did you know that even the best in the best Christian homes, parents in the home fail and often fail miserably? We fail one another, we fail our children, and we fail God. Children in the home, they fail. They come home with report cards with D's and F's. Or you get the phone call, they're not even going to school. They throw tantrums. They embarrass you. And that's my job to embarrass them, by the way. <laughs> they're disobedient, they're dishonest, they're deceptive, they're disruptive. But God's word tells us that all of us are sinners. None are righteous. No, not one. It's not a, you don't have a perfect home. A, 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 a Christian home is a place where we deal with sin the biblical way. Amen? Amen. We deal with it the biblical way. In 1 John chapter 8 through 10. It says this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. So here we see The Word of God not only contains these directions about what to do when one of the family sins, but it goes on to show what to do 
to ensure against future failures. The first thing is to confess that we are still sinners. We still have this tendency. I would say this if I were to play statistics, more than half. I'm playing it safe because I only said more than half. You don't know how much more. We want what we want. That's it. We want what we want. We don't care what anybody else says. We don't care what anybody sees in it. We don't care what it looks like. It's nobody else's business how I live my life. And can I tell you, you are deceived. And the truth, the word of God's not in you. I'm not talking about being able to recite scripture, verse, track for verse. I'm just saying, no, the word of God's not in you. The truth is not in you. Did you know that sinners live in a Christian home? But did you also know that the Savior and all of his resources live there too? Amen. Amen. That Christian home, what, what, well, that Christian home is a place where there is hope. You know, the problems with Christian homes experience are caused, for, for the most part, by sinful patterns of living. In other words, we keep on doing what we've always done, and we have this idea. I want what I want. I'm the man of the house. I'm the woman of the house. I do this. I do that. It's nobody else's business. What's in the house stays in the house. Can I tell you? None of that is true. I promise you that how you're living your life never really stays undercover. And I would, I would like to state this. It would be better that it would be revealed now and you get delivered now than before you stand at the judgment seat. Yeah, believe it. You see, these patterns that we have in our lives, they develop from failure to study and to apply the Word of God and to allow the Spirit of God to empower us to do what the Word of God says. So there's hope. There's hope for the family of God. And did you know that God is the only foundation? He's the sure foundation of that hope. And that brings us to that third hope. This, this seems to be a matter of debate, but can I tell you, there is no debate. There's no debate. I understand what's, ha what's happened in the world. I, I, listen, I came from outside and came inside. I saw what the church was even before I came. And I knew that it wasn't perfect. It's like our church home or like our Christian home. It's not perfect. But I knew what I came for. Here's what I wanted. I wanted to know the truth that sets me free. Amen. And when I started learning the truth, I said, okay, well, I want her to know the truth. I want him to know the truth. I want him to her. I want everybody to know the truth. And that's why I... I suppose one of the reasons I'm standing where I'm at right now, because I didn't want to withhold the truth. As a child, the truth seemed to be withheld from me. But when I grew up, when I was a child, I acted like a child. But when I grew up, I said, you know what, I'm done with this childish stuff. In Acts chapter 1, verse 15, Peter stood up and he, in the midst of the disciples and he said, the number of names together were about... 120. Now this is that first church, the, the Jerusalem church, and it had a list of about 120 names. That 120 names on that list made up their membership. And the Bible says, shortly after this, that all of those members assembled together when? On the day of Pentecost. And the Bible says in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, I'm here to tell you there's a precedent that's been set by God. That's why we should gather together. You know, and according to the scripture, they gather together more often than we do. Come on. See, the important word here is this. Well, watch this. They came together on the day of Pentecost. Continuing on in verse 41, it talks about some specific people that were added to membership. It says that they, that they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto, added unto them about what? 3,000 souls. I suppose you can say that was the first megachurch. Amen? And that first megachurch, they didn't have... 
else. Maybe they didn't have big screen projectors. They didn't have in, uh, in amplified instruments. They didn't have, they probably didn't even have pews. And they weren't but still, there's a mega church that didn't have smoke and fireworks and all kinds of glitter. They didn't have any of that. All they had was the love of God and the love of others. Can you say amen? amen? See, the important word here is added. It's showing that the number grew. Whether they were written down on paper isn't necessarily the issue. The fact is that certain specific people were saved, baptized, and they were added to a certain specific group of people. Can you say that's a church? And some might say that they had added that to that invisible universal body, but can I tell you in context that can't be the case. There's a lot of folks out there today that they, well, you know, I'm a member of the universal church. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a free will agent. If you're still a free will agent. So much of the scripture supports submitting to one another in the fear of God. So much of the scripture supports submit to those who are over you. No, but it's going to be over me. <laughs> Give that one up. I know I did. I still wrestle with it from some time, from time to time. Amen? There was a, a specific group of people who had assembled together, and now there were additions to that group. So the Lord added people to that local church. And how did they conduct themselves? Well, let's stay in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, there's 47. Here's how they conducted themselves. They praised God, having faith with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily as such should be saved. Now, as the word was preached, people got saved. And as the people got saved, they desired to obey the word of God. And in obedience with God's word, they submit to, to baptism, and they submit to being united with the church. So why do we need a home church, you might ask? <laughs> you might want to write this down. You're going to have some people that you may, you may already know some people that want to debate. Just give them the biblical answers. Here it is. The Bible says. And if they don't want to believe what the Bible says, there's no debate. First, we need a home church for identification. We're clearly unashamed. Now, wait a second. If you're still living in your sin and you're not ashamed, you might want to consider whether you're still really part of the church. It doesn't mean you don't attend the church. Hello? That means you don't submit. You don't submit to the obedience of the word of God. You don't submit to those who are over you in the, in the Lord. You just don't submit. And you're hoping that just by your appearance that makes you secure. So why do we, why do we need a church? Sunday school, family training hour, uh, and I, I hope there's a fair amount of teaching in my preaching. That because we come for we come for instruction. Instruction in what? Biblical doctrine. Yes. Amen. Yes. We come for influence, testimony, and witness. And this is something I've been for years encouraging everyone here. You need to write down. Start sit down someday. Start writing down a testimony. What were you saved from? How has your life changed? Can you even speak about it? Do you, can you even articulate how God saved you? And how, how has your life changed? And get this. How is it changing you for tomorrow? Are you going to be prepared for that home in heaven? The other thing that we get in church for is for involvement. I, I appreciate Brother Marty bringing his son, and, and uh, when, when Gavin comes and, and he brings his friends, and, and we get here on, on sometimes on the weeknights and we're playing some worship music. My goodness. Fellowship and ministry. Pizza's pretty good, too. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I like food, amen? I mean, some, some, it's going to happen. You know, there's, going to be, there's going to be some Friday night. We get together, we play some music, and then we go sit down to eat. Next thing you know, somebody breaks out a, a deck of Uno cards. Or, uh, God forbid, we, we break out the Monopoly, because that means we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> and, you know, if you ever, ever watch, even the best Christians play Monopoly, there's some, 
It's like they start to lose their sanctification. <laughs> or some of them become beggars. <laughs> but let's continue in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. In 42 it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Every person ought to have three homes. Do you know for sure that you have a home in heaven? I'm not, I'm not going to ask for your hands right now. I want you just right now within yourself. <clears throat> Do you know for a fact that you've got a home in heaven? Do you know certain? Are you certain? Not, oh, I hope so. So many, so many people who believe it. Oh, I hope so. Wait, wait, what do you mean? Did you know, not know that you can know so? Did you not know that you can be sure of the promises that God has for you? And, and if you're not certain of it, now get, get this. I understand there's some people that they're going to they're gonna say that they're certain, but then when you find out how they, they're living their lives, you can say, somebody, you need to talk to somebody. You need help. You might want to properly apply your, the, the, the word of God to your life, but do you know for sure that you have a home in heaven? Do you want, how many want one? I, I, I want to see those hands. How many want a home in heaven? Amen. And if you're not sure, if you're not certain, why not this morning break free from the, those chains of shame and allow us to show you from God's word how you can be sure today? It's tough. Really, it's, it, it's hard confessing our faults. I've got to be perfect. More and more, that's the number one thing probably I, I speak to uh, uh, young and older ministers about where they, they, they wrestle with the fact that they, they have struggles in their life. Did you know we all do? It doesn't matter where you are. T temptation doesn't know any boundaries. But it does recognize a slam door. You, when, listen, when, when that temptation comes, what do we do? How do the thought comes into our mind? Maybe it wasn't a person, place, or thing. Maybe it was just a thought. Well, the Bible take, says take every thought captive. Take it captive. And how about your Christian home? Does your home need a few repairs? Is it kind of crafty? Maybe it needs. Maybe, maybe you've got a little. Maybe you've got some. Maybe you've got some foundational issues, and it's, the foundation is not firm. The Bible talks about you know, on Christ the solid rock I stand. You remember the song? We build our our house on solid rock, the rock Christ Jesus. And if you build your house on that rock, it shall stand. And wherever wind and wave comes, that's what it will do. It will stand. But if you're building it on shifting sand. Then come, then pray. Allow the saints of God, the people of God, the church of God, help you with this. Well, maybe, maybe that's it. Do you have a Christian home? Or how about, I, I guess I'll get personal. Would you call this your church home? Most of you here would say yes. It's interesting, we have folks that call it a church home, but they, they, very, they very rarely frequent the home as they ought to. The home that Christ made possible. We'd rather stay safe and secure in a house made with sticks, a house made with hands, than the one that has not been built with hands. Now I get it, this is just a building, but do you get the context? Do you get the sentiment of what I'm saying this morning? And maybe you've never said it, but maybe you should make it something that would become part of your testimony. And you may tell people, why Jesus? Why church? And why this church? I can tell you, uh, it's happened in every church I've been. And I praise God for the people who stood up and said it. But several, 
when they were asked, well, why this church? And several times I heard, well, no other church would have me. Now, I think it's sad. And maybe you're sitting here this morning, you might want to recognize you might be one of those people. And maybe you're being accepted. Why? Because we have God, we have the love of God in us. And did you know that God loves the sinners? Amen. Amen? But you're going to get upset when, when one of the saints of God, one of, the, one of those who walk in, in the light of the word, tell you, you need to change how you think and act. And you get offended by it. And if you're offended by the word of God, if you're offended by the truth, then you've got more problems that need to be dealt with. Every person needs three homes. And maybe you've been in, in church for a while, and maybe you've been in the faith even longer. And maybe something's happened to you, and, or and maybe, I don't know, uh, maybe some of you have never heard teaching or preaching like this before to encourage you to get out and witness. I mean, you've heard it. You know, go on to the highways and the byways. But did you do it? Most did not really do it. You tried it a few times. The door got slammed on you. So you just, okay, I can't do this. I'm, they're not going to slap the door in my face. Well, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't do that every time you shut the door in his face? Did you know he keeps coming back to you? Did you know he says, feel after him? The Holy Spirit is right there near you right now, and he's never, he's never forsaken you. And I think about it myself of how many times I have failed him. But here I stand. How many times I thought, okay, I, I need to make that phone call because I, I failed again. Or maybe I'm just worn out. Maybe life is wearing you down. Maybe you need to learn how to pray for the Holy Spirit to come and to revive you. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Sometimes a hallelujah says more than an amen. Sometimes a hallelujah is followed by an amen because as soon as you start praising God, come on. Amen. As soon as you start praising God, did you know praising God can make a difference every day? How many of you could use a little revival right now? A little stirring in the spirit. The Bible says, and they continued steadfast from the apostles' doctrine and fellowship the breaking of bread and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. I can stand up here right now and I can recite some of the events that have taken place right in the sanctuary. But those of you who are there, you remember it. You remember the things that have happened. We have seen the lame walk. We have seen the dead raised. We have seen sickness healed. Along with that, though, we have seen people who are taken from our midst. But when they left... We had a sense of peace. Oh, we still had loss. Can I get an amen? We still suffer the loss, but there's a sense of peace. When we know that that person, when they left, we knew that they went to their heavenly home. And we know that someday, what does it say in Thessalonians? That we will not prevent those who've gone before us. When is it going to happen? When's he coming back? The trump of God shall sound. The trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise. Mm. We're going to join to the hallelujah. We're going to join together in the air. Hallelujah.